Good morning, everyone. For those of you in the back, there's still some seats up front if you want to filter in. I know we've got a, a packed house today. Uh, good morning. Welcome to Synergy 112. What's new in Citrix virtual apps and desktops? My name is Adam Lotz. I'm on the product marketing team for the virtual apps and desktops product line. Uh, this week actually marks my 19th year here at Citrix, so it's great to see so many familiar faces out there. And I'm Joe Augustin. I'm a product manager with Citrix. Together with a bunch of other product managers, we own the uh, Citrix virtual apps and desktop, both from an on-prem product perspective as well as a cloud service perspective. So let's dive right in. Uh, first, I've got a quick note from our lawyers. So while most of this discussion is going to be all about existing shipping product features, things we've done over the last year, we are talking about a few forward-looking things, some that's coming in the very near future, next couple of weeks, as well as some longer-term items. Just want to remind you guys that we're not going to commit to any dates in this session. I'm just trying to give you a better view of what's going on in engineering, what we're looking at for future technologies, and how you can help plan going forward for your environments. And I'm not going to spend too long on here. Hopefully, everyone has noticed we've changed some product names over the last year. Uh, perhaps more importantly, we've changed product versioning over the last year as well. And that's really to help everyone uh, have a better understanding of what version they've got, how far out of date they might be, and to give you a quick reference for where you're at. Uh, so I know I had lots of people coming up to me yesterday at the booth saying, oh, I'm on 7.15 LTSR. What's changed since then? I sort of had to go back and think, OK, I think that was you know, August of last year. So here's what's come out in the meantime. Uh, so we now moved to a year-month version format. So if I talk about 1906, uh, that's 2019, uh, the June release that's coming out pretty soon now. So very easy to understand what's going on. Now, I want to talk about the different release vehicles we have for the virtual apps and desktops product line. Um, and we've got the cloud service, the current release, and the LTSR releases. Uh, so if I could just get a quick show of hands, how many people are running the Citrix virtual apps and desktop service in Citrix cloud today? OK, good turnout. And now the current releases? All right, and the long-term service release. Wow, OK, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's great. Uh, OK, uh, Metaframe XP 1.8. <laughs> oh, yeah, all right. We, we definitely got to talk after this session, all right? There have been a few feature improvements since then, although I know it's a great stable platform. You might want to think about upgrading. Uh, so we talk about these. It's really about uh, consistency, um, your ability to support it for long, to long term, and the different feature sets you get. Uh, so if you're looking at the Citrix cloud service, of course, that's where we've gone out there. We're managing the Citrix infrastructure for you all. And I, mean, I know Citrix Cloud can be a bit of a challenging name for some people. I like to think of it as Citrix Infrastructure as a Service. Right? So that's where our ops team has offloaded all that mundane work of managing the Citrix servers themselves um, and push, push that off into our, old our own cloud environment that we manage. Uh, and that's very important because we can manage that. We can have great tie-ins between all the different Citrix services. And we can roll out new features as quickly as every two to three weeks. Uh, so if you're on the cloud service, you're definitely getting the fastest Citrix experience. You're getting the best feature releases that we can. And we've got lots of infrastructure, lots of ops team members making sure that's uh, reliable and available for all of your users. And of course, talking about Citrix Cloud, those could be public cloud workloads, private workloads, workloads on-prem, lots of flexibility for where those VDAs are running. If you're on the current release, we've had about a quarter, quarterly release schedule for that lately, although we're committing to maybe two to four a year. Uh, again, we'll do regular drops of features that hit Citrix Cloud. They've gone through that sort of soak period with users out there, and then roll up into an on-prem release you can consume. And then, of course, the long-term release. Um, so the LTSR, I really want you to think about that more for predictability, not so much stability, right? So it's for those organizations that want to have something that's in place for two to three years. Um, it becomes very easy to maintain. You've rolled it out once, and then you're looking at the future for the next LTSR and how you roll up that next uh, set of features. So I'm happy to announce uh, that we're working on the next version of the LTSR right now. Uh, we're currently targeting that for Q4 of this year. Again, it's not a commitment, but it's going to be close to that date. Um, and if you're an LTSR customer today, this might seem counterintuitive, but that means you should really be looking at the current releases right now in your pre-production environments. And that's because we've got about a six-month window now where if you were to raise any support tickets, have any questions for us about the current 1906 release, we could still get those features into the next LTSR in time for that late end-of-year ship. Um, so lots of opportunity there. And I'd say, again, you know, pre-release environments, definitely take a look at what we've got coming out now. Uh, we actually have a fireside chat today at 420. Uh, where you can discuss the LTSR with some of the product managers there. Uh, so again, there's quite a few of you running LTSR today. I'd encourage at least 10% of you to go down there uh, and discuss that with the, with the product managers, see what we can do for you, and talk about the feature set. Now, something else we mentioned in the keynote uh, yesterday was Windows Virtual Desktop and our Microsoft partnership, and what's that going to mean to you? And I'm super excited about this functionality, because as a longtime Citrix employee, we don't get new platforms to work on top of all that often. Uh, so, of course, we talk about the Citrix Cloud Service, the virtual apps and desktop service that manages your on-prem workloads, your cloud workloads. And we've got lots of users uh, currently running those workloads inside Azure. 
What Windows Virtual Desktop is bringing to us, though, is a new license entitlement. Uh, so Microsoft is saying that customers that are on Microsoft 365 E3 or E5 will be entitled to WVD benefits in Azure. Uh, it's actually bringing us a new operating system, which is this new multi-session Windows 10 OS. And that's very interesting for us here at Citrix, and you guys should definitely pay attention to what that means uh, for your users. Uh, so historically, we've had only the server platforms to build off of uh, for what I'll call ZenApp technologies, right? We had RDS, we had multi-user uh, server sessions, and there are some trade-offs there when it came to things like usability, application compatibility, and everything you had to do as administrators. Uh, so with multi-session Windows 10, Microsoft is effectively bringing the multi-user capabilities of RDS and for the first time applying those to an end-user platform of Windows 10. So you're going to get that usability experience and the compatibility uh, that you see with Win 10 on top of this new platform. Uh, now this is all brand new, right? It's currently in public preview from Microsoft, but I encourage you to go out there, sign up for your public preview, preview trial, sign up for that Azure account, and start using Windows 10 multi-session in your Citrix environments. And what's perhaps most important to you is that the Citrix Cloud service, so the virtual apps and desktop service running in Citrix Cloud, can do hybrid management of your existing environment alongside these new WVD workloads. So you'll be able to run all of your existing Citrix applications, all of your existing on-prem workloads, and start spinning up new workloads in the Azure cloud using these Windows Virtual Desktop benefits side by side. So everything you do today with image management, app layering, the VDAs, all of that is going to apply to the Windows Virtual Desktop workload and will apply to Windows 10 multi-session specifically to really enhance that end user experience. Now, when we talk about Citrix virtual apps and desktop, we like to focus on our three core investment areas. Experience, which is about the best possible user experience across any device. Security, Citrix virtual apps and desktop is secure by design, but we continue to invest more on security-related features and capabilities to keep improving or keep upping the, uh, the security posture of the application. And choice, when people think about Citrix, the word any usually comes to mind. So for us, it's about choice, providing choice to IT organizations, not just in terms of infrastructure and public cloud providers, but also choice in terms of the management and the monitoring tools that are available for you for your administrative needs. When we talk about flexibility, one of the first questions that comes to mind is about which, for anyone who is considering the journey to the public cloud, is which cloud do I even start off with? I would like to start the choice section by, by emphasizing the fact that Citrix has long been known to provide any application or any desktop on any device, on any network. But now we are taking that one step further by stating that that application or desktop can live on any cloud, be it one of the major public cloud providers, or it could be a private cloud on your data center through a combination of hyperconverged infrastructure appliances or using uh, virtualization techniques like Citrix Hypervisor, Microsoft Hyper-V, uh, Nutanix AHV, or VMware vSphere. When we talk about the public clouds, we actively support Amazon AWS, Google Cloud Platform, Microsoft Azure, Oracle Cloud, and as of yesterday with the keynote announcement, we also are also actively supporting VMware Cloud. Citrix's man cloud control management plane has always had a presence in the United States and uh, the European Union. Um, recently, we also introduced our presence, our cloud control plane, on the uh, Asia Pacific and Japan region. So with this, APJ customers and partners who have their workloads in the US or the EU regions can now think about moving or migrating their workloads over to the uh, APJ zone. Continuing on the hybrid story, so one of the key features that we have recently released and we are most excited to talk about is Autoscale. Autoscale takes operational efficiency and cost savings to a whole new level by allowing customers to judiciously consume their hybrid cloud investments, especially when it comes to public clouds. So with Autoscale, you can define your time-based and your load-based scaling factors, which can then automatically power on or off or scale up or scale down your virtual machines and your workloads so that you have workloads which are ready to be consumed as soon as your user comes in. From a schedule-based uh, schedule based scaling options, we have options where you can define uh, for every single day of the week, you can define what your predicted load is. So if you have uh, a, a pattern in terms of when your users come in or if you have a specified business hours, you can define that on the schedule based and the, and the auto scale function kicks into picture and keeps all those workloads prepped and ready for use. With load-based scaling, you can define what your peak hours are or what your off-peak hours are, and Autoscale can, can uh, based on the settings that you have configured, allow for a buffer capacity of workloads to be made available and ready to be used. 
Together with schedule and load, bailing, load balancing, uh, the load, bal load based scaling, they work together to give you uh, flexibility in terms of having a high operational uh, efficiency, while also making sure that your cloud compute costs are on the lower side. If you are a customer who has some, let's say, workloads on-prem on in your data center, and also some compute on the uh, public clouds, you can configure autoscale so that the on-prem resources are consumed or exhausted before you are going to the, uh, out of the public clouds for, for the cloud workloads. Autoscale also uh, reports the uh, information that it collects, both from a cost-saving perspective, as well as from a capacity utilization and power logs directly into Director. So it, along with the Director functionality, you can very easily visualize how Autoscale is helping you or positively impacting your operations. We introduced local host cache for uh, our Citrix Cloud service customers, Citrix Cloud word labs and desktop customers late last year, uh, which basically comes into action whenever you have any, any network-related outages or any internet outages where your Citrix Cloud connectors cannot communicate with your Citrix virtual apps and desktop service. In those scenarios, when you have that kind of an outage, the last thing you want is your users, your end users who are already connected to a session to be uh, in an outage mode or be interrupted in their session. So local host cache comes into picture or comes into play at that time by taking over the uh, brokering transactions. So the Citrix Cloud Connector essentially starts behaving like a secondary brokering device and preserves the user sessions during an outage mode. Whenever network connectivity is restored, the brokering operations or the brokering responsibility is passed back into the Citrix virtual apps and desktop service on the cloud side. And again, this happens without any user impact. So if you look at the sequence of events from a user perspective, if they are already consuming a session, if they're already connected to a VDA or an app, they go from a normal mode to an internet outage mode and back to a normal mode without any impact on their side. Google Cloud is a strategic partner for Citrix, and we continue to see more and more customers starting to adopt it. And accordingly, we are also increasing our investments in that area. So we introduced uh, automated scripts for resource location deployments on workloads which are running on Google Cloud, and we followed that up with power management capabilities on Google Cloud workloads. Coming soon is support for MCS or machine creation services with Google Cloud workloads. So this will bring all the features and functionality with Citrix provisioning out onto workloads which are running on Google Cloud. ServiceNow is one of the predominant IT services management applications out in the market today. If you're an enterprise, most likely you're getting requests for new virtual apps or new uh, desktop requests through a ServiceNow ticket. Usually the user, the end user who is supposed to get access raises a ticket, and it goes through a few approval hoops before it finally lands at the desk of a Citrix administrator where he or she has to now provision the application. Although the tool is efficient, the elapsed time between the start of the ticket is, uh, to the uh, user actually getting that application could be extremely high. With the uh, ITSM adapter for ServiceNow, the uh, ServiceNow tickets, which are for Citrix virtual apps and desktop resources, can directly communicate with your virtual apps and desktop implementation. So this can drastically reduce the elapsed time in uh, where the workflow has been executed and the app is finally provisioned to your users. Faster execution times means that your user has access to the application that they need and they can start becoming productive uh, much sooner. We introduced user layers late last year, I think late 2018, as, uh, as a way for admins to make better use of their base images by applying customizations, by applying, allowing uh, user, inst user application installs and personalizations, all as separate portable uh, layers on the stack. So in 2019, our team has been busy on adding more and more certifications on the platform as well as the application side. So we introduced uh, Office 2019 certification as an app layer. We have also added Server 2019 certification as an operating system layer. We have also introduced support for Gen 2 Hyper-V images as well as VHDX support. As we look at the second half of 2019, the app layering team is now busy at working to decouple the user layer from the rest of the app layering uh, piece. This, we think, will be a welcome replacement for customers who are still using the personal VDisk feature. And uh, there is one of our engineers from the app layering team who is at the Expo who is uh, demonstrating the user personaliz personalization layer, which is one of the newest features on the app layering side, which is coming soon to Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktops.
If you are a current customer who is consuming or who's using the VDisk feature, I would highly recommend you stop by the booth and check it out. We continue our investments on the license usage uh, page on the Citrix Cloud, and we are extending it from just being in the context of Citrix Cloud customers to also including our on-prem implementations. So from a Citrix Cloud perspective, we now have added the features to uh, release licenses. So if you have users who are not actively uh, logging into the application for 30 days or more, as a cloud administrator, you now have the option to release those licenses and send them back to the pool. We have also added active use metrics, both at the daily as well as the monthly terms. And from a historical perspective, we are also showing you a trend analysis chart, which shows you what has happened in terms of license assignments or license releases over a period of months. That same trend analysis also works for active use. So it helps the administrator identify patterns in terms of seasonality that you can, um, any inferences that you can draw from that. Very recently, actually as recent as last week, we released the new license server, which now has the ability to talk to uh, the Citrix cloud services. Now, this is an opt-in feature. It requires a one-time registration from uh, the on-prem license server. So within the license server, there is a li Citrix licensing manager utility which allows you to initiate the registration. This does not require a Citrix virtual apps and desktop license or a subscription, but it requires you to have a Citrix cloud account, which is available for all our customers and partners. So once you have this setup, once you have the, uh, once you have the, the on-prem license servers reporting that information onto the cloud, it draws into the same usage patterns that we have in terms of the other license and usage uh, area. So you can collate that information, you can view that information, the same trend analysis that we talked about is also available. The system is smart enough to understand the different editions and different licensing mechanisms that you have and display the charts and uh, graphs accordingly. Now from a security perspective, all this needs is an outbound 443 port to be opened from your on-prem servers to the cloud. There is no other inbound traffic that's coming in. So we have kept the number of uh, hindrances or number of obstacles to get this information out to a minimum. We continue to see growing demand for Linux-based workloads, especially amongst our developer community, and we continue to invest more and more on that side as well. So specifically, uh, I want to call out machine creation services. So with the enhancements that we made recently, we have now achieved, uh, we are on par with what machine cre MCS offers for our Windows VDAs versus our Linux VDAs. We also introduced support for 18.04 Ubuntu, which was one of the most asked features from our Linux customers, um, and also added federated auth as well as fast smart card support. Fast smart card support is an improvement over the traditional HDX-based smart card redirection that we used to, which uh, it helps in situations where you have high latency van, van situations. Also on the graphics side, we have uh, now s compliant with the high efficiency video coding standards as well as H.265 for graphics compressions. From a, from a director perspective, from a reporting perspective, we continue to enhance the information that the VDA is sending over to the director, and most recently we have added the ICA round trip time to the director under the session details view. When it comes to choice and flexibility, we also continue to innovate on our hypervisor platform, and there are two releases that I wanted to talk to you about specifically. Last year, late last year, we had the uh, Zen Server 7.1 LTSR CU2 released, which, was, which includes all the issue resolutions that have happened since the pre prior uh, cumulative update, and also brings in new features in terms of Windows 2019 support, uh, support for cloud, uh, Citrix Cloud v6 licensing, as well as common criteria certification. Last month, we released Citrix Hypervisor 8.0, which is the first release of the Hypervisor platform with the new product naming convention. But it also includes a lot of changes in terms of, big changes in terms of the Linux kernel itself. Along with all those changes, we are also introducing new features. Uh, some of them are, uh, we introduce support for virtual desk images, which are greater than two terabytes. Uh, we also introduce support uh, for guest UEFI boot on Windows VMs. Um, and from a, from a customer who's using a vGPU-enabled VM, we now have ability to take a disk and memory snapshot of, of, on those uh, vGPU-enabled VMs, which basically means that when you're resuming a VM, when you're standing it back up, these disk and memory snapshots are then restored, leading, leading to faster boot times and performance. 
One last thing about choice before I hand it over to Adam is our focus on the APIs. So Citrix virtual apps and desktop team is focused on providing an API first approach. So we are um, investing heavily on the API side, not just from introducing new API routes to, them, to, to our customers, but also allowing new uh, technologies to be consumed. So orchestration API, which is in private tech preview at this point, um, basically consumes RESTful APIs. It's a RESTful interface which allows or which provides customers and partners the same level of access or gives you access to the same level of APIs that our Citrix engineers also use in-house. So for example, if a Citrix engineer has to, let's say, use an API to create a machine catalog, the same interface that our engineers use is also available to you as a customer and a partner. More importantly, it also allows you to look at future use cases which might be of interest to you. For example, if you have a help desk admin, if you have a couple of help desk admins who perform only a certain handful of operations, instead of having them to log into Citrix Cloud with the studio interface and then going through the UI play on that, you could come up with an alternative, your own console, which has only those three to five transactions or six transactions exposed, which gives them a very easy, clean approach to uh, managing the help desk role. Our product manager for uh, APIs, Angelo, is at the booth, and he has a very slick demo where he is using his mobile phone to, uh, to perform transactions, to initiate transactions within the Citrix cloud, on, within the Citrix studio on his mobile phone. So if your APIs is something that interests you, you should go out and check, check out the demo that he has. Uh, also, I wanted to call out the fact that we still continue to be invested in PowerShell. So RESTful APIs are just an alternative. It's uh, one of the newer technologies out there, but PowerShell still continues to be supported and will be uh, will will still see innovations on that side. Thanks, Joseph. So let's dive into user experience a little bit. Uh, so certainly in the keynote, you heard a lot about experience. You saw a lot of the things we're optimizing uh, in the workspace environment, talking about intelligent workspace and all the user experience benefits you get there. We're also making a number of changes inside the virtual apps and desktop product line as you keep that up and give your users the best experience for the virtual apps and desktops sessions. And one thing I want to talk about first was our CPU usage for the VDA itself. So everything in the VDA stack that we use to deliver that end user experience. And we've been hard at work over the last eight to 10 releases on really driving this footprint down. And that's very important for you all, whether you're in on-prem environments or in the cloud. So in on-prem, of course, this means you're gonna be able to get more user sessions uh, onto that server. But in the cloud, the benefit's perhaps you know, more obvious in that every bit of CPU usage we can help you drive down is gonna reduce your overall compute cost, which in many cases you're paying for by the second. And so lots of work going on here to reduce our footprint for the VDA while still expanding our functionality and the flexibility that we offer on both low and high bandwidth connections. And on that note, we made some really interesting changes to our HDX adaptive throughput technology. Uh, so HDX adaptive throughput is actually gonna detect when you're in a scenario where the user has a very high bandwidth connection, right? So they've got a click path to the data center, they have high bandwidth, low latency, and they're doing some maybe multimedia playback or interactive voice sessions, things where they need a lot of, uh, a lot of compute, a lot of bandwidth power. So with adaptive throughput now, we'll actually use up to four times more bandwidth than the current releases than we would have back on the LTSR to deliver that great experience. And of course, we're a friendly network citizen. If we see congestion on the pipe, we see that, that bandwidth needs to scale back, we will we'll adjust the user session accordingly. Uh, but this is an interesting twist on what we typically think about for the HDX ICA transport. And we've actually seen some customers that have seen server resource reduction because of this, since there's less processing going on behind the scenes, we kind of offloaded some of that work to the network instead. And they've actually seen some density benefits because of it. And talking about interactive sessions, voice, video, and uh, video conferencing, um, of course, we're very close partners with Citrix. I'm happy to say that we have over 700,000 daily active users delivering Skype for Business sessions in their Citrix environments today. And we're carrying that optimization through to Teams. Uh, so even for you LTSR customers, last year we released a Teams optimization pack for the web-based Teams client. And we're continuing that evolution now. And with the 20, let's see, the 1906 release that's just coming out, we're also rolling out an optimization the Teams desktop client. So it's not quite ready yet, and you'll actually need a future version of Teams desktop, but lock, watch our blog space to see releases notes about that and figure out exactly which uh, release of the Teams client you're gonna need. Uh, but that's gonna optimize the experience, whether it's for, for chat, video conferencing, or screen sharing, and really give you the best Citrix managed experience for that Teams deployment. And we know that people are using all sorts of different endpoints with Citrix environments, and Chromebooks 
have really seen a big uptick over the last couple of years as a low-cost, easy-to-manage device. Uh, so we've also rolled out a real-time optimization pack for HDX uh, for Chromebooks, specifically for things like the, the Skype for Business experience, to improve that interactivity and give your users the best experience for the Microsoft communication products, regardless of what their endpoint is. Now, virtual display layout is another technology that's really helping us keep pace with hardware evolution. Uh, so in the past, we heard a lot about specific markets, like financial traders, that might have had four, six, or eight displays uh, on their physical desktops, right? They had a whole wall of monitors, perhaps, that they're watching different financial markets, uh, having different application sets open. Uh, so with our virtual display layout technology, you can now take these new 4K or 8K physical displays and carve them up as virtual monitors and then assign sessions out to those monitors individually. So it really lets you take the most advantage of new hardware and take advantage of those modern display types um, while giving users a very easy to manage environment that feels familiar to them and lets them lock uh, individual applications to those displays and carve that up nicely as they see fit. Now, we've had dozens of features released over the last year, and I want to call out just a couple of them here. So I talked about the high bandwidth ends, the improvements we've made there. We've also worked hard on our low bandwidth connections as well. Uh, so we've seen a 20% overall reduction in graphics bandwidth for typical workloads. Um, we've made some changes around our uh, cloud connector technology. So our Citrix cloud uh, clients can now bypass uh, the HDX cloud connector for their ICA traffic, which is going to let you see as much as three times the scalability you have seen before. So whereas in the past, you might have said, OK, about 1,000 connections per cloud connector. Now we're saying you can probably get up to 3,000 uh, through that same server. Uh, we've locked down uh, printing with uh, SSL control from the VDA to the print server and made a number of improvements across our technologies like build to lossless and progressive display. So the most technologies that take place when users are, for instance, scrolling up and down a page or perhaps scrolling through layers of an image, uh, we're, again, trying to reduce bandwidth and give the best experience there so that once the user stops the motion, we can snap uh, to perfect display quality as quickly as possible. So lots of optimizations across the board uh, in the VDA, in the clients, and the ICA stack to provide that best experience. And of course, we talked about workspace a lot and giving you a unified experience across your devices, uh, whether that's desktop, mobile, tablets, anything you've got out there. And I know some of you LTSR customers might have felt a little bit left behind by that. Uh, so I'm happy to say that we now support site aggregation uh, for our workspace deployments. So that means you'll be able to take advantage of workspace in the cloud and everything that we talk about in the workspace benefits, the intelligent workspace benefits that will be coming later this year, and tie them into your fully on-prem uh, Citrix virtual apps and desktops environments. Uh, so using site aggregation is simple. Uh, you'll go up, you'll log into Citrix Cloud, create your Citrix Cloud account, um, create a workspace, and using site ag, you just type in the name of your on-prem storefront server, give us a network path back to that, and we'll read up those uh, apps and desktops that you're hosting on-prem and deliver them via the workspace interface. Uh, now, importantly, that doesn't touch your on-prem infrastructure at all, right? So this is a completely side-by-side -side deployment. So you can give that workspace URL out to a select group of users, maybe, maybe your IT staff, maybe it's just a testing deployment, and you can keep all of your on-prem storefront as it is today, so we're not going to disrupt anything there. Uh, so quick and easy way to get up and running with workspace and start to dip your toes into these new technologies that Citrix is offering. We've also made a lot of changes to Director over the last year. And some of the most significant ones, I would say, are in the login duration uh, processing and analysis that we can do. Um, when I say login duration, I really mean anything that happens from the time a user clicks on an application till he has an interactive session that he's up and running with and can use. Um, so when you get those help desk calls that say, Citrix is slow, or my application takes forever to launch, these login duration improvements let you really drill down into exactly what's going on in that user session um, with, with fantastic granularity. So we're tracking uh, more than a dozen individual components so you get things like uh, profile load times, uh, application launch time, network, network responsiveness, and really understand exactly what's going on uh, to create that session, which in the past could have been a bit of a black box. Uh, and if you've got a comfortable seat today, I would say stay in it, because the director team is up next in the next session, and they can give you a lot more detail on what we've done there. Uh, we've also added more functionality, uh, like desktop probing. Right? So we had app probing in the past, which lets you pre-launch sessions across your network to really do end-to-end -end testing, and we now support desktops with that as well. So you kick off a couple of sessions to run at 4 a.m. every day, make sure your entire network is responsive, that apps are ready to go for when users start coming in. Uh, we've also increased our uh, analytics around uh, session reconnect events. So you can determine which ones were caused by network outages versus maybe uh, user behavior. Uh, and dived in a bit more to the HDX Insight metrics so you can understand what's going on with user responsiveness and overall session performance. And of course, all this can be backed with up to a year of history inside Citrix Cloud 
So you get a very good view holistically of what's gone on in your environment over time. And speaking of user experience, uh, we talked in the keynote a bit about performance analytics, which are really the next step in Citrix analytics to help you understand what's going on with your users. Uh, so as we progress through the analytics journey, first we talked about security analytics and our ability to monitor sessions and all the different Citrix services to understand what's going on uh, with connections, uh, user accounts, and, and logins. And then we were talking about performance analytics as the right way to keep tabs on what's going on in these individual sessions. And the analytics inside uh, the ICA traffic are especially important. So we'll mine these from both the server side as well as the client side and give you a picture of what's going on across your enterprise and with individual users so you can drill down again and understand exactly what they're seeing. And we're going to score these users for you so it's very easy to identify users that are, that are getting that bad experience um, and give you uh, clear metrics to dive into to help debug those sessions and get a feel, better feel for what's going on. We've also put, put quite a bit of work into our brand personalization service, which is in public preview today. And we've had the desktop personalization out for a few months now, and we're just now getting to the mobile personalization as well. Um, this is going to let you, as, as IT owners, roll out things like application names, uh, icons, and color themes to really personalize that end-to-end -end experience across the Citrix products, regardless of which application or which device the user is connecting from. So it's a great way to reinforce your own brand and make sure that users know they're connecting to a secure internal resource and something that they can trust as a service you provide. The WEM service is something else interesting that we've recently brought to Citrix Cloud. And if you're not using workspace environment management today, I'd encourage you to take a good look at it. Uh, and one of the barriers that our customers had was that it required a little more infrastructure on its own to set that up to get the services up and running. And what WEM can do is really optimize your end user experience uh, both on things like profile load, uh, controlling misbehaving applications, clamping down on, on apps that might be trying to chew up CPU, um, but also uh, to manage um, you know, the, the full experience that users get as they connect and improve log on times and overall server density. Uh, now, by rolling out the, the WEM service in Citrix Cloud, we've offloaded all that infrastructure maintenance uh, from you guys so that WEM becomes really uh, just a few clicks to turn on and a much easier deployment for your end user population. And of course, we're always talking about the Workspace app, which is the evolution of Receiver. And again, just a few highlights of features we've added. Uh, it's probably in the dozens to hundreds of new features that have come out over the last years. And we really strive for parity in the Citrus experience across platforms, while still trying to be mindful of the fact that every platform is a little bit different. Users expect a native experience, whether it's on a tablet, a desktop, a mobile device, uh, but still provide uh, that same reliability and connection experience, no matter where they're coming from. Uh, so lots of changes going there. We've got a lot of the Workspace app engineers down on the expo floor. And I'd say absolutely stop by, talk to them, see what they're working on over the next year. Now, security is a key tenant for all products at Citrix, including Citrix virtual apps and desktops. So for us, the way we look at security, it's not just a simple black or white in terms of access denied or access green, granted, but looking at more from a contextual awareness perspective in terms of where the user is coming in and what other information do we know about the user to make better choices in terms of security. I would like to kick off the, uh, the security section with what we at Citrix refer to as a secure digital perimeter. There are lots of relatable components in this eye chart here, but I just wanted to highlight a few of them. So bring your own identity. We know, we understand that enterprises today have their own identity solutions through third-party providers like paying Google Okta or whatever the case may be. So the secure, the secure digital perimeter is aware of that and takes that into consideration when making security recommendations. Contextual access, as I had just talked about, is, is not just looking at the username and the password, but also trying to understand where the user is accessing this information or where this user is accessing this application or desktop. Is that a normal usage pattern? Which device are they using? What kind of tasks are they using? What, what kind of network activity are they initiating? So trying to understand, trying to learn from all that, and then deciding what needs to happen with that. Also, there is a disappearing notion of DMZ today. So with the cloud sprawl that's happening, it's no longer the case, or most likely it is no longer the case that your data still resides only in your data, data centers. It could be across multiple servers across the globe. It is amplified by the fact that all these SaaS apps are now in a high availability, availability um, uh, they provide HA services. So with Citrix security and performance analytics, you can bring that security context back or keep your data secure without compromising on the business use cases or the business users. With uh, the security analytics, can uh, keeps listening for indicators in terms of uh, 
what contextual access is uh, providing that in terms of where, what device, what information is being accessed, et cetera, and uses that to define threat levels and then also trigger actions based on whatever the admins have configured. Our goal with the secure digital perimeter here at Citrix is to ensure that business users can have the flexibility that they, that they require, but also have the IT administrators be in a position where they can secure the data. Talking about industry certifications, we continue to keep up with all the relevant industry certifications. So our 715 LTSR was certified with FIPS uh, and as well as certified with common criteria. We are also 508 compliant, and the VPAT survey results for that are available on the uh, Citrix.com website. We are striving to get to a SOC 2 as well as a FedRAMP uh, certification on our uh, Citrix cloud service in the next couple of months. Let's talk about session watermarking. So in today's day and age where a mobile device can actually potentially become a security threat in terms of the, uh, the fact that a user can pick up a mobile phone and simply click a picture of any data that's presented on their screen. How does an IT administrator or how does a security analyst go and protect that data is something that we're trying to address with session watermarking. With session watermarking, admins can choose what information they want to show on the screen, so as a watermark. You, you as an admin can decide if it needs to be a username or a VDA host name or the IP address, et cetera. And once that is enabled, once those security policies are in place, the session watermarking is respected from the time the user logs into a Windows or a Linux VDA, and it also carries forward to any web and SaaS properties through Citrix Access Control. Session watermarking is available on our traditional storefront implementations, as well as it's also available with the Citrix workspace experience. Another uh, feature that's coming soon to Citrix workspace is the app protection policies. This was touched upon in the keynote and I just wanted to dig a little deeper into it. So we, uh, in, in today's day and age, there are user devices which end up being compromised or they have uh, malwares like screen scrapers or key loggers installed on them, which could become a security nightmare for any enterprise out there which is trying to implement a secure digital workspace. So with the app protection policies, from the login screen onwards, we have protection policies which will block any of those key loggers or those screen scraping uh, tools or malware that are out there, providing a very secure interface for your Windows and Linux apps, as well as for your web browsing or your SaaS application. This security policy also extends into the Citrix files realm, which will help you keep that property also secure. Now, the way app protection policies is being uh, deployed is that it is through our existing Citrix Studio security policies as well as through Citrix access control. So from an administration and management perspective, the desire is to have a very seamless or a very simple to manage uh, security policy, which is just an add-on to what we already, what, what our administrators are already used to doing. There is, uh, so at the expo hall, there is a booth which specifically talks about the app protection policies, and if security is something or these kind of concerns are something that you're interested in, please go check it out. Secure Browser Service is a cloud-based, isolated web browser which is provided from a Citrix cloud perspective, and your, you, you as IT administrators can provide this to your end users. So this allows an IT organization to segregate your business applications, your business data, your business people, network, et cetera, devices, et cetera, from the threats of open internet. We continue to invest more on, uh, on the secure browser service side, and we have expanded into new regions. And we have also in introduced new algorithms which can intelligently route the traffic based on the best possible user experience for, uh, for the end user. We also have introduced client drive mapping, which allows the end user to have access to their local files, even though they are browsing on a cloud-based web browser. We have also done lo admin localizations, which our secure browser service now supports up to five languages, five local languages uh, uh, on the admin side. Delegated admin, this was, uh, when we released the cloud service, this was one of the most requested enhancements which was uh, missing on the Citrix uh, virtual apps and desktop service side. So since then, we have, over a period of time, we have continually made investments on the delegated admin side. And today, we are on-prem with what we, uh, we are on par with what we offer on-prem for uh, the, from a delegated admin perspective. So you were able to do custom roles. We have now introduced the ability to do custom scopes as well, giving you the ability to define security or the access to your virtual apps and desktop administration console, depending on your security apparatus. 
Config logging was also introduced, which essentially does a trail of all the activities that an admin has performed on uh, your site, on your Citrix virtual apps and desktop service site. This is important not just from an admin perspective, but also from a troubleshooting perspective. When you're trying to answer questions like what happened when, the config logging piece comes into picture and you can easily trace back to what has happened or what specific transactions were done at what time. We have had a lot of interest from our customers to adopt the workspace experience. And one of the biggest blockers for them was the lack of two-factor or multi-factor authentication. So we recently introduced the simple support for simple two-factor authentication with workspace, where when a user is trying to log in, they're, they're prompted to enter a TOTP or a time-based OTP password, which could be generated from any of uh, the TOTP applications out there, be it Google Authenticator, um, Authy, or Sem Semantic VIP, et cetera. Once the user has entered the, uh, the TOTP into the console, that's when the session is validated, the password is validated, and that is when the, session is then, the user is then connected to the workspace. So this is available today. This is very good for customers who are just starting off. But what about customers who have already made massive investments in identity on-prem? So there are a lot of enterprises who already have their third party, who, who already have a gateway uh, server on-prem, which is already integrated with their third party identity providers like Google, Ping, Okta, et cetera. It might also be the state that you have a multi-factor authentication already enabled through smart cards or through other uh, MFA techniques. So coming soon in public preview is going to be an integration between the workspace app and the workspace and the, uh, the on-prem gateway, ser gateway servers. So the way this works is from a user perspective, when they try to log in or when they try to browse to the customer.cloud.com, that is a workspace URL, the service will then redirect them to the gateway, uh, the gateway server, which is an FQDN, and then basically depending on whatever identity investments that you have made, whatever identity uh, configurations you have done, the same configurations can then be implemented there, and the user can then seamlessly transition back into the workspace experience. So this is coming soon in public preview as early as next week. Or soon. Thanks, Joseph. And just to wrap things up, I want to talk about how we can keep you up to date. So it's fantastic that you're here at Synergy or that you're watching online, uh, but we really want to keep you up to date more than once a year on what's going on inside the product. And we've got a lot of different ways we can do that. Uh, so the Citrix blogs are a great way to stay up to date on bigger feature releases. And as I said, we'll go into some detail there around deployment, configuration, uh, who it's right for for the end user. Of course, you've got email, social, and web as great communication channels for smaller features that we roll out. Um, but I wanted to touch a bit on our in-product messaging inside Citrix Cloud specifically. So we have both new feature releases as well as in-product walkthroughs of new functionality that rolls out, which is especially important when we're doing these releases once every couple of weeks. And we've actually seen a marked reduction in support calls from people that are interacting uh, with these guides inside the product. So we know they're working. We know people are taking advantage of them. I want to encourage you to keep that up. We're putting a big investment here to make sure you're up to date on what's going on. We also do a quarterly webinar talking about our current releases as well as the upcoming LTSR. And we typically get thousands of attendees uh, live for those webinars and then thousands of rewatches later. So it's a great way to stay up to date on Citrix technology. And again, we'll blast through all the new feature releases, feature updates, and talk about who they're important to and how you roll them out in your environments. So we've just about exhausted our time here today. Uh, Joe's and I are happy to grab a couple of the architects and developers, and we'll meet you in the back corner of the room for questions so the next session can, all, can come up. Thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your show. <laughs>